God started dealing directly with Jews. He gave them the, uh, the Mosaic law. He set them up as a nation. And so they go 1,500 years, and they are uh, enmeshed in the Mosaic law. Of course, the Mosaic law is impossible to keep. And I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is the moral law of the Mosaic law. You also have uh, the social law, you might say, that has to do with the, uh, the way that people are going to interact with one another. Then you have what is the spiritual law. That's where they have the sacrifices and the feast days and all these things. So the Mosaic law comes along, and then by the time you get to um, Christ on the cross, it was just 50 days after he was resurrected that we have a change in dispensations. God temporarily set the Jewish nation and the Jews aside because they had rejected him, and now he's dealing with the people that is known in the church age. We're in an age that is unique from every other age. And it's when the Pentecost was going on, you started having a baptism. But there was baptisms before that. There was baptisms by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was in the age of the Jews. And so his baptism was different from the baptisms that took place after the day of Pentecost. They, they were completely different. In, in John's day, he was the herald of the king. And when he came forward, he was baptizing people and they were being identified with the kingdom because John was the herald of the king. The king was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was on earth. He had been born. And now they would be baptized, putting their faith in the coming Messiah. They didn't even know who he was at that time. And when they did that, then they would get, of course, eternal life, and they would uh, get God's own righteousness, the same thing that we get in that regard. But there's several things that they didn't get that we do get today. And so on the day of Pentecost, there was a completely different uh, motif, I guess you could say. And there were uh, what was it, 500? There was a large number of people that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, on the day that the church age began. And that, church, that baptism was different than John's because they knew that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. In other words, it wasn't just in John's baptism baptizing someone into uh, the kingdom are being identified with the kingdom because the king was there, but they didn't know it was Jesus Christ until what we looked at last Sunday, Palm Sunday. You have Jesus Christ coming in as the Messiah, and they recognized him. They all they had heard that he was on the cross, and when Peter started giving the account of what happened on the day of Pentecost then people understood, okay, we're not waiting just for our Messiah, and we're not going to be identified with the kingdom. They were going to be identified with Jesus Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that, that began at the day of Pentecost. So what I'm telling you right now is, is enough. If I stopped right now, and didn't say another word, and you were not initiated into this knowledge about baptism, you would say, enough, that's too much to swallow. I have to chew on this a while, let it sink in before I can go on. And I, I'm, all, all I'm doing is just taking one little aspect of baptism and how it was different in the time of the Mosaic Law and John the Baptist baptism and what happened at the church. At the, when, the, when the church began, it was different. Because not only were you baptized in water, and there were reasons for that, but there are seven other baptisms that are referred to in the Scripture, and there are four dry ones and three wet ones. That means that four of them had nothing to do with water baptism. Three of them did. That was, those were the ones that were 
using water. Now, with that in our background, I hope I didn't confuse you. I hope that kind of clarifies some things in your mind. We're going to start looking at the difference between real and ritual baptisms. And I hope that you get the opportunity someday when the subject comes up of baptism and somebody might say, uh, have you been baptized? Well, <laughs> that's, kind of, that's another thing right there. Uh, you can say, yes, I've been baptized and never have been water baptized. And you would be telling them the truth. Why? Because every person in the church age who believes in Jesus Christ is baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the four dry baptisms. And being baptized with the Holy Spirit means you are identified permanently with the Lord Jesus Christ. You didn't even know it took place. Usually a person doesn't. All they know, they hear the gospel and they believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went to the cross. He died for your sins, the sins of the world. And when you believe in that, then you, but through that faith, you're born again, and you have eternal life, you have God's own righteousness, and a host of other things. So when someone asks you, are you baptized? And I've done this in the past. I said, yes, I'm baptized, and, and I've been baptized. And if it goes no further, I might not, depending on what the Holy Spirit leads me to do, I might not say anything else. And you're not, you're not fibbing, you're not lying, you're telling the truth. But if you think it's a time to, to help a person understand more about baptism, if you really want to get, their, get into their mind, say, yes, I've been baptized, but not in water. What do you think they're going to say? What? And you, you, could, you, t you could take it from there. So <clears throat> if I hadn't completely made everybody uh, go into... Uh, turmoil in their soul will continue here. This is, what, this is what we went over last time, and I'm just giving you some aspects now that I didn't have then. I didn't go into that, uh, that deep of the ex explanation, but that is part of it that you, you need to know as being a prepared believer that you can, you can speak about baptism, whether it was in John the Baptist day during the Mosaic law, or whether it was after Pentecost, or on the day of Pentecost, that's how that uh, baptism, and we're talking about water baptism here, was different. But then we also need to know of the other places in the Bible where it talks about baptism, and they're used in a different way. And I talked about this before. Baptism uh, was is really transliterated from the Greek word baptizo, B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. And transliterated means they didn't take this word and translate it into something in English. Uh, something, in other words, translate what the meaning was. They didn't do that. All they did was take the Greek letters, baptizo, and bring them into the uh, English, and it comes out as baptism. It, baptizo in, in English is baptism. And why that is, that there's so much confusion is because if they would have just defined what baptizo means, given the definition of it, then people wouldn't just use the word not know what it means. And if they had baptized, oh, excuse me, uh, defined it, then they would, have, if they did it correctly, they would translate it to mean identification. Because that's what it's all about, is identification. And we went, oh, I went over this here. The physical change in, takes place uh, when a nail, for instance, if you take a nail and set it, set it beside a, or on a magnet, what happens when you come back two or three days later and you take that nail and you put it over there, put it on something metal and let go, what is it going to do? Is it going to fall off or is it going to stay there? It's going to stay there, isn't it? Why? Because it has been influenced by that magnetism from that magnet. And it, it actually changed something within that magnet. So that's, that's the change we're talking about. So let's look at real, real baptism. We'll go through this and I still have some questions at the end. A real baptism refers to a real change that takes place when a person is identified with someone or something so that he is literally transformed by that identification. And so a, Ritual baptism is uh, always using water. The water symbolizes something that a person is identified with. The ritual may be meaningful 
and produce an emotional experience in a person, but no real transformation takes place. It's a ritual. Actually, in the first century church, it was used as a teaching or a visual aid. They were used to learning by ritual. And they didn't have books, they didn't have paper, they, most of them were illiterate, so of course this is the way they learned, learned from ritual. And so they would go down into the water, and that would signify death, and then they would come out of the water, and that would show they go from, from being dead, spiritually dead, then when they believe that Jesus Christ, then they're saved, and they come out of the water, back into life, now they have eternal life, it also uh, is a symbol of resurrection. This is what they were learning. And that's the reason because they didn't have the text, they didn't have a completed Bible, they didn't have the New Testament where we can read and find out what's going on. They didn't have that. And so that's why the what, what the ritual, ritual baptism had to do. So this word baptizo is used for both real and real baptism. So when you're looking in the Bible, you're reading and it says baptism, you can't take, you can't understand a dry baptism from a wet one by the word. The same word is used for both a spiritual baptism and a ritual baptism. The same word is used. So how can you tell whether it is a dry, a spiritual baptism where something really takes place or a ritual baptism? You Tell by the context. You tell by how it's used. That's how we always use it. And the first thing we had, and I'm just going to go through this quickly, is the baptism of fire. And the baptism of fire is used like in Matthew 3, 11, uh, Matthew 13, 25, and 30, Luke 3, 16. When John Baptist came to baptize Jesus Christ, and Christ indicated he wanted to be baptized, and John the Baptist said, oh, no, no, I can't do that. You're the one that ought to be baptizing me. And the Lord said, if you don't baptize me, then I don't have anything to do with you. And he says, okay, I'll baptize you. But he said that he wasn't worthy to unlatch the sandal on Christ's uh, foot. And, but he said, but when, when he does come, this was before he met, he baptized Jesus, he says, I'm not worthy of even unlatching the sandals of the Messiah. He says, but when he comes, he will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Now, those are two types of dry baptisms. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the first one he was talking about. The next one he was talking about in that verse, it's another bad type of baptism, baptism of fire. And that's referring to what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns. Jesus Christ is not here with us anymore on earth, not physically, but he is coming back. He promised he came back. And so we're in the church age. The church age is going to end sometime. We don't know when, but when the church age is done, we will be raptured. We'll go with be, and be with Christ, and there'll be a we'll have an evaluation in heaven. And while that's going on, will be the tribulation. It will be the worst time there ever was or ever will be. It lasts seven years. At the end of that seven years, then Jesus Christ is going to come back from heaven. Who is he going to bring with us? Who is he going to bring with him, I should say? He's going to bring us, but he's also going to bring the Old Testament believers. We will already have our resurrection body, but when he returns... He's going to bring the Old Testament believers, and when they get down to earth again, they're going to get their resurrection body. But when he comes back, all the unbelievers on earth are going to be identified with fire. What does that mean? It means that they're going to literally be destroyed. They'll, every unbeliever on earth will be essentially killed, and they will go into Hades, a, comp a compartment of hell, where they will be with all the rest of the unbelievers from all from time immemorial and they're waiting for the great white throne judgment to be judged. But when Jesus comes, Christ comes back, that's what the baptism of fire is. Fire has to do with judgment. All unbelievers will be identified with fire. So that's the first one we see there. The second one has to do with the baptism of Moses. I'm not going to linger here. I still got all these questions uh, that we, I want to get to, but... <clears throat> I want to go through this enough to where we'll uh, review it. When Moses went through the Red Sea, and of course they went across on 
dry ground. God divided the waters. They went across on dry ground. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, it says that the people were baptized with Moses, means that they were identified with Moses. And even though I said this is a dry baptism, people think, yeah, what do you mean the dry baptism? They walked through the Red Sea, but it was dry. What did the water do? Well, the water killed the Egyptians. Everybody that was in the water, uh, identified with the water, if it died. They were identified with Moses because they had to have faith to walk through the Red Sea. Uh, you know, I don't know how the deep, red, how deep the water was. It might have been 50, 100, or 200 feet deep. We don't know. But when they walk through, can you imagine what it was like? And you look up, and there's water 200 feet over your head. And, 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 and you had to make the decision to walk out there and go through it. And so they were exercising their faith in the Lord. And they were identified with Moses, of course, because uh, Moses was uh, the one chosen by God to be the father of the Jewish nation. So that's how they were identified. It was a real identification. But it didn't have anything to do with the water. The water is what destroyed the Egyptians. Then we have the baptism of the cup. The cup represents the cross. When Jesus Christ was baptized, he was identified with our sins on the cross, resulting in his death and resurrection. Jesus Christ voluntarily took on the sins of the world, and when he went into that water, that's what he was doing. He was identifying himself with the sins of the world, and of course, when he came out, he was resurrected from that. That's what that is, is referencing. And of course, people say, I want to follow Christ in his baptism. Nobody can do that because they're not qualified to be the Savior of the world. If they identified themselves with the sins of the world, it wouldn't mean a thing. They're already guilty. Christ was the only one that could do that and it be uh, sufficient to the Father. Then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like I said earlier, was when you believe in Jesus Christ, then you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit identifies you with Jesus Christ permanently and forever, and nothing can change that. And every time you see in Christ, in the Bible, not every time, but nearly every time in Christ, it's referring to our identification with him. How did it feel when you were baptized by the Holy Spirit? Anybody know? No, I don't... Maybe, I don't know how anybody could know that. I mean, I don't think a person that doesn't, that is not saved and they go from a spiritual death to spiritual life, most of the time they're ignorant of most of the deeper things of the Bible. And even today, if you go into the churches, let's say just evangelical churches, even the Bible churches, and you ask people, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? They would be hard-pressed to under, to tell you. And all it is is simply when we were saved, when we believe the gospel, we were identified with Jesus Christ, and you do not feel it. You don't. There's none of these things that are what you feel. It's what God has done. Later on, if you grow up in the Word, then you find out, okay, these things happened at the point of salvation, and God is the one that did it. You find out later. The ritual baptisms, we have the baptism of Jesus, and of course I explained that a while ago. The water represented the Father's will for Christ to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. Another way of saying that is the water represented that uh, re represented the sins of the world, and he voluntarily took those on. So Christ voluntarily submitted himself to the Father's plan, Matthew 3, 13 and 17. The baptism of John, I said, uh, explained that a while ago. The water represented the believer's identification with the kingdom of heaven that was prepared, uh, that Christ was prepared to usher in. However, it was postponed because he re was rejected by his own people. Can you imagine that? In fact, we looked at Palm Sunday last, last Sunday. We looked at that in some detail. And the same people that were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, and, and to, in the highest Hosanna, and Hosanna we saw, was in the Hebrew, Yashanah, that comes into the Greek, Hosanna, 
And it means to save. They were saying, save us. He's the Messiah. Approximately three days later, they crucified him. And when he stood before Pilate, Pilate was trying to get out of it. He said, look, here's this murderer here. Uh, you can, you can uh, let Christ go and he'll, we'll put him on the, uh, on the cross. They, they had a choice of letting Jesus Christ go or the murderer, and they chose the murderer and let go, and they crucified Jesus Christ. These are the same people that were saying, Hosanna to the highest. Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was three days earlier, and now they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. That's how fickle people are. And then the last one here in the baptisms, the ritual baptisms, were the believers that would be baptized in the first century uh, the identification of, of, of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is given in Acts 9, 18 and Acts 10, 47 through 48. That last scripture especially is important because it shows that they were saved before they were water, bapti water, water baptized. So it shows that water baptism does not save. Okay, let's go down here now. By now, everyone should be able to answer the following question using your own words. Number one, is infant baptism necessary to be saved? Is it biblical? Well, I want you to think for that, about that for a moment. If somebody was talking about infant baptism and you were going to give your opinion on that, how, what would you do about going about explaining to them whether it is necessary for an infant to be water baptized or not? The first thing you might, of course you want to ask is, is it biblical? What does the Bible have to say about that? The Bible doesn't even handle infant baptism. That was something that was concocted later because it, it just, uh, it's not, when I say it's not biblical, it means that it can't be verified by the Bible because it's not in the Bible. And every other thing we know about water baptism, in the first century, they were baptized with water. After they heard the gospel and they believed the gospel, then they were water baptized. And what it did, it helped them in this ritual way show, to show the spiritual things that went on that are invisible, they showed by a visible ritual. But the first thing, it means nothing if a person doesn't believe the gospel. So infant baptism is something that was concocted later. And if somebody says any, if, let's say you're invited to go to a christening. A christening is when they baptize a baby. And it's, it's, they make it pleasant and they have a rich rigmarole that goes with it. But you have to decide whether you want to go because you would be participating in a ritual that many people think is going to save this baby when it's not even biblical. And that's decisions that people have to make. Some I heard people say, well, I don't want to make that the issue and, and uh, get crossways with people. Then they won't listen to me. Uh, I've been asked to go to these in the past, and I declined. I just said, I, I don't believe in infant baptism, so you know, I, I really don't, don't want to be there. I'm not trying to argue with them. I'm just stating that's my belief. And they should accept that. Now, if they say why, then I can, I can go into explaining what baptism is really about. And if, if I want to explain baptism to someone... I'm not going to be talking about water baptism because I don't even think it's relevant for us today. What I'm going to be talking about is the baptism of the Holy Spirit because that's the one that really counts. That's the one that is part of what happens when you believe the gospel. Instantly, when you believe the gospel, you're identified with Christ forever. Nothing can change that. So what does that tell you? That's a big, that's a big assurance for us. If, if we can never not be associated with Jesus Christ means that we have eternal security, means we have eternal, eternal life and all that. So that's my first uh, question. The second one is, 
Must adolescent and adult believers be baptized in water in order to be saved? Now, we know it's not right for infants because infants, they, they don't know anything. And so if they're baptized and they haven't accepted the gospel, it doesn't mean anything. And we have looked and seen that they don't have to be baptized in order to save them or enable them to go to heaven until they are old enough to believe. So whatever the age a child is, when he starts to be able to understand the gospel and to accept it or reject it, all that time frame bef before that, if a child dies, he immediately goes to be with the Lord because, first of all, it's the righteous thing to do, and God is infinitely righteous. But moreover, he has not, the child has not done the one thing that would keep him away from Jesus Christ and out of heaven would be reject the gospel. He hadn't done that, so of course it would be unfair and unrighteous for God to condemn a child that didn't do the one thing that will put people or where people will wind up in the lake of fire. It's not their sins. It's the rejection of Jesus Christ. They didn't do that, so they go to heaven anyway. So, is it biblical to say that adolescents, adolescent and adult believers uh, do not have to be baptized in water to be saved? I think at this point you all recognize uh, that is not true. You don't have to be baptized with water to be saved. But when you make a statement like that, then you have to be ready to defend it. And the way to defend it, I believe, is to just go to the Scriptures. You might start out by saying, well, Paul, told, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul told the people in Corinth, that he is God, he didn't baptize any but just a couple of people because they were arguing over who was a big spiritual giant because of who baptized them. It was a, a controversial issue even then. And he says, uh, God did not send me to baptize but to give the gospel, to speak the truth. The Holy Spirit would never have that in there if water baptism was necessary. Question number three. Are church age believers commanded to be water baptized? To be, excuse me, baptized with water? If you ask a hundred believers that question, probably 98 to 99 of them are going to say yes. Most of the time they go to Matthew 28, like I said, and I've gone in detail about that. Matthew 28 is, uh, go into all the world and uh, teach the gospel, baptizing them and so forth. Give you the only command there is go into all the world. Teaching and baptism, baptizing are participles. They cannot be in the imperative mood of command because participles don't even have that, uh, that function. So you can say that church-age believers are not commanded to be baptized with water, but they're going to challenge you on that. And you can, you can just put it back on them and say, show me where I am commanded to be a church age believer, commanded to be baptized with water. And if they can show you that, you can say, I'll gladly do it, but you have to show it to me. Usually they go to Acts in the, that's the pre-canon period before the, the church just got started. And they were using baptism in order to teach them what the scriptures teach us. It was a kind of a teaching aid. It was a fill-in. But we don't need it now. Post-canon, now that the, the canon of scripture is completed, we don't need to fall back on that. Just like the spiritual gifts were given temporarily. They were given as a help, a boost, until the scriptures came about. Question number four. What is or was the purpose of baptism? <laughs> wow, that's a tough one, isn't it? People wonder, that they say how important baptism is. And if you ask them what was the purpose, that's going to challenge them. But you have to know the purpose. And you can't answer that in a, in a broad statement, a paintbrush that hits everything. 
Because really, the purpose of water baptism is different. It was different, remember, in, with John the Baptist that was identifying people with the kingdom. Once the church age came in, the purpose of water baptism was to teach them the spiritual aspects, the things that occurred to them when they didn't have the scriptures to tell them. It was a ritual. It was a teaching aid. It also, uh, the purpose in the first century was if a Jew got baptized, then he would be extricated from the family. They would condemn him. They would be ostracized. They may be actually thrown out of the family. And it was a good thing that they would do that in this way, is that it would help them to stick with the New Testament, with the doctrine, with the fact that they recognize they are Christians now. They are God's royal family. And it's different than those who were still, maybe there were believers in their family that were uh, saved in the Mosaic law, and they would still reject those that came in, that were baptized in the church age, and they would not accept the distinction, the difference. And so, and that happens today, especially in places like the Mideast, if a Muslim is, is evangelized and they accept the gospel, their very life is at stake if they go and tell their family, I'm a Christian now and I've been baptized. Because under the Muslim laws, they can actually kill, they can execute a, a, one of their family members for that and they would celebrate it. Let's see. Uh, okay, so what is the purpose of water baptism? I hope that I explained that enough to you where you can tell someone else what it was for. The main thing that you need to remember is that the purpose for water baptism was not, is not, and never will be the purpose of salvation because water baptism never saved anybody. Number five, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When you're talking to someone that's never heard of this before, you, don't, you, you try to make it simple. You simply explain to them that when you believe the gospel, the moment that you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit identifies you with Jesus Christ. It's not something you feel. You don't even know that it's happening at the time, but you, as you grow and learn doctrine later on, you understand that this took place. And every time, or nearly every time, you see that, uh, like in in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, uh, to those who are in Christ. In Christ. You see it, it's, it many, many times in the Bible. That's not just words that mean, what does in Christ mean? It means that you're identified with him. You have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Every believer in our day, in our age, that believes the gospel has been identified with Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how bad they are, how good they are, how whatever it is, they're identified with Jesus Christ and nothing can change that. That's, that's how I would explain the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I could tell you a lot, it's not progressive, it doesn't happen. Some people say, well, that happens way after, if you grow to a certain spiritual level, then you'll get that. No. First, just remember this. First Corinthians 12, 13. That's the book, the, uh, verse that you want to go to and identify with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For we were all, all believers, baptized into one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Into, by one Spirit, into the body. What is the body? The body of Christ. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. And I believe that's talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But for, for, if you can remember or put it in your Bible somewhere, under baptism of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that's a very powerful verse that explains what that is. Number six, what's the difference between a real and ritual baptism? Well, we can just skip that one because we already went over it. But to answer it, it to, to define this in a way that is short, 
and easy to understand. Just think the difference between a real and ritual baptism. You can say it's the difference between a dry baptism that has nothing to do with water and a ritual baptism where water does exist and the water represents something else. And in a dry baptism, there something actually really happens. It's not something that we cause to happen. It's something that God automatically causes to happen. For instance, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we go from being alienated from Christ to being in Christ, identified with Christ permanently. That's a real change. But when the person gets baptized in water, they might be very emotional about it and everybody's happy and all that, but no real change like that takes place. It's, it's more of a teaching aid. It was a teaching aid. Now we don't rely on that ritual because we have the completed canon of Scripture that tells us exactly all the spiritual things that take place when we believe in Jesus Christ, there's over 40 things that happen that we don't need that ritual anymore. And point number seven, how many baptisms are there and which ones are dry and which ones are wet? Well, we just went over that. That shouldn't be all that difficult. Uh, I don't know if you can name them or not, but and they don't have to be in, in order. But you have the fire, remember? Baptism of fire, the baptism of the cup. You have the baptism of Moses. And you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are the four that are dry. Those are spiritual identifications. And then, of course, you have the three wet ones. And that was John the Baptist baptism. He was baptizing with water. And then you have Christ's baptism. He was baptized with water. And that was significant because after he came out of the water, God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And Peter needed to shut his mouth and listen instead of talk. And I don't mean to demean uh, Peter. I'm, I'm, I like Peter. He was uh, impulsive. He, he just liked to... Uh, he got into trouble a lot. He told, <laughs> he told Christ, I will never forsake you. Everybody else might leave you, but I will never forsake you. That's at the upper room discourse where Christ is saying that y'all are going to scatter, scatter like a bunch of quail. And, and Peter said, I will never do that. And Christ said, before the, before the uh, crow crows, uh, the cock crows three times, you'll, you will disown me for three times. And, and it, the Bible is just so wonderful in expressing itself, especially when Jesus Christ uh, takes charge, when he's, when he's talking. So where we we're going to go next is here. What is free grace introduction? And I bounce off of what I have in the well, Kindle. I have the, the whole book in Kindle of the 21 tough questions about grace. And I was going to go into what is free grace and there'll be the introduction and, and definition. And so there's maybe a couple, two or three paragraphs, and then he uses a phrase, a phrase about the health and wealth prosperity gospel. And what I do, what I was going to do after I read that part, I would say, I'd, I'd ask that question, but then here we go explaining what that is, what the health and wealth prosperity gospel is. See all this I have on this? This is on, and it's really interesting because there's a verse in here that may, probably many of you don't know. Um, it's down here in Mark chapter 3, verse 10. I'll let you chew on this one a little bit because the, the shysters use Mark 10, 30 in order to say, you give us a hundred dollars and God will turn it into a hundred thousand, hundredfold. And they go to this verse in Mark 10, 29 and 30 says, So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels 
who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now, uh, what do you think of that? This is the one I, I say up here. This is the one they use. Of course, they're turning it, they're making it money. You give us a hundred dollars and you'll get a hundred fold back which would be $100,000. And so that's what I was going to go in just to uh, handle this phrase uh, in here where they say, uh, grace has nothing to do with the health and wealth and prosperity gospel. But without the book, I had nothing to bounce off from. So we'll, I'm going to make sure I have that book next time. I either have the book or I'll get the notes on here and we'll go through that. Okay. <sighs> One last thing about baptism, because we're going to leave it and not go back to it maybe for a while. Most people are confused, very confused about baptism. You don't want to seem like a know-it-all, and you might be tempted to show off a bit and say, there's not just one baptism, which is water, there are six other baptisms as well. And then you can start explaining what each one of those are and be very flamboyant and very articulate about what you say. It might make you feel good, but you've lost them. They won't even have a frame of reference for most of what you're saying. So what I'm saying is when, if you start talking, if baptism comes up, you want to keep it simple. Something that they can that they can understand. And this is true every time you engage someone, the less you say, the better. The more you ask, the better. You want to find out what they believe and where they got it. And when if they say, oh, well, you have to be uh, baptized to be saved, you, you just ask them, where did you get that idea? And most of the time, there will be people who are in the, the category of, I guess you would say, religions that have liturgical uh, ideology. In other words, in the Catholic Church, it's a sacrament. In the Catholic and the Lutheran Church the, and the Episcopal Church and all that, they have Holy Week, which we are in right now. And they make, uh, for instance, when, when Lent starts, it's the 40 days before uh, Easter. I don't think they count weekends there. And they put ashes on their forehead, and they uh, try to give up things. They try to make some kind of sacrifice. These people are well-meaning. They want to serve the Lord, but they are in ignorance. And what they are doing is blasphemy because they're essentially saying what Christ did on the cross was not good enough. So now we have to give up sugar or cigars or ice cream or whatever it is in order to be acceptable to God. And they really believe that. And our job is not to be condescending to them or better than them. We would just bring up, ask them, why, why do they believe that? You wouldn't even have to go to the scriptures if they say, well, uh, we do it because uh, we're, we're we're giving up something for the Lord. And I would say, why would you do that? What you're trying to do is get them to understand you are trying to make a sacrifice in order to be acceptable to God, which means it's, it's blasphemy because it means that you don't accept Christ's suffering and atonement on the cross. In total, there's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing you can take away. The Holy Spirit will help you if you're in fellowship. So I'm just throwing out those for you to not get too deep in the weeds. I want you to know these things for yourself. But when you're talking to people, just ask them, why would you want to do that when Christ said on the cross, it is finished? In 1 John 2, 2, for he is the propitiation for our sins, I mean the satisfaction to God. God was satisfied with his, his atonement. He is a satisfaction for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. So why would anybody have to sacrifice when he said it's done? 
That's the kind of questions I think might be uh, most effective. Well, we're out of time, and we will uh, continue next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that your word is so deep and so specific that we can know exactly what water baptism was for and how it changed from time to time. And the danger is that people put more emphasis on it than it is due. If someone is water baptism, water baptized these days, we certainly don't want to condemn them or judge them. That's between them and you. But we do, we do want to be able to stand firm that water baptism does not save and it doesn't lead to the abundant life. It's a ritual to teach. That's essentially what it is more than anything. There's nothing mysterious about it, nothing magic, nothing that actually is going to determine whether you're going to be saved or whether you're going to be a, a more spiritual or not. It doesn't save sins. It doesn't do any of these things. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what we want to concentrate on so that they'll know that they can be assured if they believe the gospel that they are in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is in them. So help us to put this together, fit it together in our own mind. And we thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You were going through complete misery back there.